This is a Europhile review of Port Royal by Alexander Pfister. I think that's how you pronounce it. I, don't, well, I have no idea, actually. Uh, let's call him Alexander Pfister. Um, so I don't know anything about this designer, apart from I know we've got one other game by him, which is uh, The Mines of Zavendor. Another thing about these, and it's the thing that first attracted me to Port Royal, is that they're both illustrated by Clemens Franz. So Clemens Franz is the guy who most famously illustrated Agricola, but then the rest of that series of games, so Caverna, um, La Havre, or uh, Labora, and at the Gates of Loyang. Now, I love Clemens Franz artwork. It always makes me look at a game, uh, so, so it always draws my attention to it. And with Port Royal, the other thing that really was the decider in me picking this up is that it features mechanics from what is now called Ink and Gold in its most recent editions, although it used to be Diamant um, by Alan Moon and Bruno Feduti. So that's the, the classic card game, the, the push-your-luck game, where you turn over cards and you take treasure, but, but there's going to be traps there, so how long can I keep turning over those cards before the traps get me and I lose everything? Well, the same sort of thing happens in Port Royal. We turn over cards, we reveal ships, but too many uh, uh, of those things will lead to, you know, disaster, lead to the end of your turn and losing everything that you've gained in that turn. So it's got elements of diamond and ink and gold, but it's also got engine building and euro type mechanics in there as well. This is purely a card game. There's nothing else in this box. And it, it's a pretty decent sized box and a decent number of cards uh, for £10, which is how much it costs. It's a really cheap game. That's another major selling point for it. Cheap game, um, considering the size of it and, and, and also the, the fantastic artwork on it. Um, so let's have a little look at how it plays and then I'll let you know what I think of it. So this is the box for Port Royal. It says on here it's for two to five players, 20 to 50 minutes, which seems realistic. Inside we've got this sheet of rules, which a uh, uh, fold out sheet. There's some bad. English translation on there, but basically they're very easy to follow and they're nice clear pictures and all that sort of thing. Um, so that's fine. Inside the box there's just two sections for cards, but the cards are all part of the same deck, apart from this one, which gets mixed in if you're playing with five players, hence the five hats on the back. Otherwise you don't use this card. Um, so basically you've just got one large deck of cards. And, uh, and so that's what's going to form the bulk of the game. Now these cards are going to come from this deck and form a tableau in front of you. You're going to lay out cards in front of you throughout the game. The other thing about these cards, like a lot of modern card games, is that they're dual use. So you can either use them as coins, so you can have the coins which are on the back of the card, or they can be used for their, their face sort of uh, purpose, whatever's on the face of the cards. You start the game with three of these cards in front of you representing coins. It doesn't matter what's on the back of them, you don't look at the back of them, it, it doesn't matter because they're only coins um, and you're only ever going to use them as such. So I would have three coins in front of me initially, as would every other player. If it was my turn, what I get to do is form the harbour by turning over the top card of the deck. I can then choose whether I want to use this card or not. In this instance, it would be a case of buying this card or not to gain the benefits that it gives me. Let's have a little look at what some of the cards that you might get in the game are. So the first type of card are the ships. When a ship comes into the harbour, it brings these coins with it. So if I decided that I wanted to use this, I would take three coins off the top of the deck and I would add them to my own personal supply of coins. Um, however, I don't have to use it. I can keep on turning over more cards from the deck if I like. So that's where the push your luck side comes in. So I could turn over another one. Okay, now you see this is a disaster because we've now got two red ships. If two of the same colour come out at any point, then your turn is over. These are discarded into the discard pile and the whole thing is void. But if that hadn't come out, then I could keep going. So now I've drawn a yellow one. This one's only, cost, only going to give me two. I can only take one of these cards, so maybe I'd keep going. 
Okay, now I have a black one. So I've got three different colors here and I can keep going and keep pushing my luck. So now I've got a green one. Now what happens is because I've got four different colors out here, I'm now allowed to select two of them to use. So I could, for example, select these two, in which case I would take seven coins from the deck, four plus three, and put them into my personal supply. Now on your turn, as well as me taking something, every other player then gets a turn to take something from this um, selection as well. But if they do so, they have to pay me a coin um, for the privilege of doing it. Um, so everybody's involved on each individual turn. If I kept on turning over, okay, now I've got a blue. So now I've got five different colored ships no duplicates, that allows me to take three cards if I want to, which is the best possible situation. It's hard to get to that point though, because there's half this deck is made up of ships. So um, they're constantly coming out and it's very easy to get a pair. So that push your luck thing, it, it's there, but it doesn't come into play massively often. Here's another black one, for example. So if I pulled that one out, now my turn would be over. I'd lose all of these and I would gain nothing. Okay, let's keep looking. So here we have a sailor. This guy has some swords. Now the benefit of the swords is if you have a lot of these swords in front of you, so if I had these three swords for example here, then I pulled out a ship like, uh, like this one and let's say that this was a duplicate, I'd already got a blue down there, then I could say, right, I'm going to use my swords to repel this ship because I've got three swords and this ship only has a strength of two. Um, I could also repel this one if this one had just come out, but I wouldn't be able to repel this one, for example, because it's got six. And I wouldn't be able to repel this one because this skull means it is not possible to repel it. So one tactic in the game is to build up this, these swords in front of you in order that you can repel ships, push your luck and take more cards each turn. In taking these uh, sailors or the pirates, I pay five coins in order to do so, and I'm going to gain two victory points, which are going to sit in front of me in my tableau. So that's what the sailors and pirates do. This type of card is a tax. So when this comes out, it says anyone who's got 12 or more coins uh, will lose half of their money. And the person who has the most swords will gain one money. So tax comes out and it applies to everybody. Um, from time to time throughout the deck. The next type is Expeditions. So Expeditions are these bright orange cards. These are placed to one side for everybody to aim for. They're like little missions. So the aim here is to try and get two of these crosses. If you do so, you'll gain four victory points and two money. So we'd put this to one side and we keep drawing from here. This is another Expedition. This time he wants two of these Settlers Huts. Four victory points, two coins again. So again, that would be set aside as another mission that all players could aim towards. Now here's how you start to complete these missions. If this guy turned up, the jack of all trades, he offers me either an anchor or a cross or a settler's hut. So I could use him as one of the resources necessary to claim one of these two missions. So I'd put him in front of me and then I could discard him later in the game in order to claim these missions. It, most of the, the resources come as single ones, like for this priest, we've got the cross, and we've got the settler's hut on this settler here, and we've got this anchor on this captain. So these would all be resources used for completing these expeditions. They all cost varying amounts of money, and the, the, the jack of all trades is six coins, where the others are four. Um, so you'd be spending coins from in front of you if you did that. Okay, then, right, there's another ship. So we've seen some ships. These are green ships coming out now in yellow. So we've got a run of ships there, a set there. So, you know, e each turn I'd be turning over one or more likely multiple cards and then people would be getting a choice. This is what I'm looking for. So these are the characters. So the characters will all do various different special abilities and offer them to you if you put them in front of you. This trader, for example, means that when you take a blue ship and take the money from it, you gain one extra money. Um, this one gives you a resource. There's another ship. I told you half, the bits, half of its ships. And now I'm looking for these characters. Right, let's see what I've got over here. So this one, for example, the Mademoiselle, she makes every character um, one coin cheaper um, for you. They also all give you victory points as well. Um, trying to find interesting cards in this deck, but all I'm getting is 
ships and resources. This one is a green ship, gives you one extra coin. Here's a red that gives you one extra coin. Here's the discount one again. This one means that if the card row gets to five, so if people have turned over five cards, there's five cards in the harbour and it comes around to your turn to take something from that, remember that everybody can take a card on your turn. You'll gain two coins if it's got that length. And there's various other cards that do different things along the same sort of lines. Um, remember that you can also take, uh, this, this is quite a, an interesting one, the Jester. So the Jester means that if a player has forfeited because he's turned over two of the same matching ships, then uh, the, the player with the Jester gets to take one coin if somebody else has forfeited. Or if it comes to his turn to take a card from the display um, on someone else's turn, it's his opportunity to take a card and there's no cards left there, he gains one coin. So the Jester's quite a nice card. But there's various different little abilities like that. So you can build up a, a slight sort of strategy, a little bit of an engine and decide how you're going to rack up those victory points, which are going to be the things that will win you the game. The game ends when someone's got 12 victory points. Then you look at who's who has the most victory points at the end of that round, and that person is the winner. Although there is also a variant uh, game end um, listed in the rulebook, which is very similar, 12 victory points, but someone must have completed an expedition in order to win. And that's how the game works. Um, so simple push your luck stuff and a little bit of engine building and resource management and that sort of thing. But it's, it's basically just gather the victory points using these dual-use cards as coins or as uh, whatever's on their face. Port Royal is a decent game. It works, basically. It works. The push-your-luck side of it is not massively present because it's, it's quite hard to even get to the four ships of different colours um, without, uh, without, you know, turning over a second one of the same colour and forfeiting your turn. Um, so players don't tend to push their luck, particularly in the games that I've played. But you could play a strategy where you try and build up those swords in order to repel ships. Um, but the push your luck stuff is, is, is there, it is present. The artwork's great, it all looks really nice. Basically, it feels like a medium, sort of, uh, fairly short, but a medium weight uh, Euro game of victory point grabbing and, um, you know, using resources, but, but also with a bit of push your luck. And it's a bit odd in that, in that it comes in this little box. It feels, it's, it's, it's a bit heavier than you would expect for a little game like this. And frankly, if I wanted to play something in this weight, um, then I would probably play something like, um, something like San Juan instead. San Juan also has that dual use of cards, um, but, but, but it does it in a, a, a more interesting way, really, um, and building up that tableau in front of you, but also being able to spend cards in order to do different things. Um, so the problem, really, with Port Royal is that it falls between two stalls. Um, I mean, if I want to play a light card game, a small light card game, I'm probably going to go for something, you know, if I'm not going for the super light trick-taking six nymph type things, and I might go for something like um, Lost Cities. Uh, but, but this is a bit heavier, there's a bit more to it, it's a bit longer than Lost Cities. Uh, and yet it doesn't feel as substantial as San Juan. It's somewhere in this awkward middle territory. Um, and if, I think if I wanted to play a game in that sort of area, then, then I'm not sure Port Royal would be the thing that I would leap for. I think that's what I'm trying to say. I would, I would either go for Lost Cities or something in that sort of ilk, or, or the trick-taking games, or I would go for something a bit meatier like San Juan. But this Port Royal is a, it's a bit odd, stuck there in the middle. And, and if I wanted to push a luck thing, I would go for Diamant or, or Incan Gold. Um, so there's something just not quite satisfying me with this game. Um, that's, that said, it, it works perfectly fine. It's a decent, well-designed game. Um, I found the ending a little anticlimactic. You know, just suddenly one player says, yeah, I've got 12 now. And everyone else says, oh, okay. There's not much that you could have done to stop them or anything like that. And you play to the end of the round, or maybe they're the last player in the round anyway, so it just ends instantly. The fact that they've added in this weird little variant rule where you also have to have an expedition, which is practically the same as the main rule, because people are likely to have expeditions anyway, 
It doesn't really add anything to the game, but it just gives me this little hint that maybe the designer was unsure about the ending and thought, well, I'm not quite sure which is the best way to go with this, so they stuck both endings in. And frankly, both are a little bit anticlimactic. It's something about being able to see all the victory points building up. There's so few victory points, it's, you know, 12 is not a big target to get to, that you can see how everyone's doing and you know, OK, he's got this much, he's got this much, I'm unlikely to catch up before it happens. And, and so... You know, there's not an exciting finish. That's, that's what I'm saying, really. So, Port Royal, main things going for it. Beautiful artwork. Decent weight game in a small box. Uh, cheap, £10. Brilliant. Really good, cheap uh, game. Uh, it's portable. Um, there's, there's nothing wrong with it, basically. There's nothing wrong with it, but I can't get excited about it. So that is Port Royal. Uh, by Pegasus Spiel and uh, Alexander, I'm calling him Alexander, F I'll call him Fiesta, Fiesta, Alexander Fiesta. There you go, Port Royal.